Hi. In the second slide of this week, second set of slides, I want to say a little bit about um, the connection between the type of spatial data and the analysis that is associated with that. So first I quickly talk about different data types and then I want to close with some pitfalls of spatial analysis, the type of things that uh, need to be kept in mind um, at the end of the day before you write your conclusions or make some statements about your findings. So spatial data types are basically uh, formal representations of geographic features. So this is called a data structure in spatial analysis lingo. And in essence, any geographic feature becomes abstracted to points, lines, and polygons. And then these points, lines, and polygons need to be stored in a particular way. Now, points are easy. Points are just x, y coordinates, and that can easily be handled in a standard framework. Lines, a little less so because they're still um, x, y coordinates, but their length can vary. But polygons are very difficult to store, actually impossible to store efficiently in a standard data flat data table because the number of vertices in the polygon tends to differ a lot. So then there's really uh, no efficient way to take that into account, which means we need specialized software, which is called geographic information systems or even spatial databases. And they uh, take into account the geometry of these features. And a lot of spatial database formats exist. And what characterizes them is a spatial index, which allows you to very quickly find where things are. We don't really have time to get into this in too much detail. Um, just um, so you know that um, Geoda uh, can access various types of spatial databases. Um, so in essence, for analysis, we can uh, differentiate between four different types of geometries, if you wish. We have points, surfaces, discrete spatial data, which have some kind of weird name, which is called lattice data. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. And then networks. In this course, we won't deal with networks, but they are increasingly also important uh, data types for analysis. And what's important to know and to keep in mind is that the type of data, whether it's a point or a surface or an aerial unit, lattice data, uh, determines the kinds of analyses that you carry out and the kinds of hypotheses that can be tested. So it's important to keep that connection between these in mind. And so just to make that concrete, I'll go over three examples, one for points, one for surfaces, and one for lattice data. So let's start with the points. So a point can be a location of a random event or it can be something that is fixed. Now, one will see, we'll see later, when it's fixed, that is actually the same as lattice data. So fixed would be, for example, the addresses uh, of houses with house sales prices. Uh, that's very different from, say, the location of an accident on a road network or where a robbery, a robbery, a robbery happened, or as we saw in this previous set of slides, the addresses or locations of the people who died from cholera in London. Those are random events. And so the, the question about these random events, these are called point patterns. The questions about these random events are really, are they structured in some way? In other words, um, is there something interesting about where these events happen? Are a lot of events happening in close by spaces, or are they just kind of randomly in space? And so that's what point pattern analysis is concerned with. We actually will only touch upon that uh, at the margin, but it's important that you know, uh, <clears throat> for example, this is a map with car thefts in the location of car thefts in San Francisco as points. So what we're interested in, in here, is there any kind of structure? Are, are more car thefts occurring in particular areas? And, you know, I'll leave it on the side that uh, 
you have to control for the population at risk and all these other things which we won't talk about now. But basically one very simple device and many of you may be already familiar with this is a heat map which picks up concentrations of higher um, density if you wish of um, these events. So this is what point pattern analysis does. It is interested in finding um, concentrations of events or some other structure in the allocation of points over the landscape that is different from random. The second broad set of types of spatial data concerns itself with what is called continuous spatial fields or surfaces. So whereas the points that we just saw were discrete points, discrete events, here we're concerned with surfaces or at least approximate um, a phenomenon by a continuous surface like air quality or noise or even sometimes price surfaces for house prices. And here the research question is different. So whereas with the point patterns, we were really interested in finding, if you wish, clusters or interesting concentrations of events. Uh, here we're more interested with interpolation. And what is interpolation? It's really a form of prediction. It's predicting values for locations where we do not observe the, 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 the value. So um, typical temperature, air quality, for example, something I worked on several years ago was for Los Angeles, um, Orange County and uh, Riverside County. We had um, house sales. The little dots are actually house sale transactions. And we were interested in finding out how is differential air quality translated into price differences for the houses. That's a classic kind of economic question. So our point of departure is these sensors. There's like 30 some sensors in the, the LA basin. The little triangles are sensors that measure ozone and the little um, circles are sensors that me measure particles. So given data from these sensors, how can we assign an air quality measure to each of these house transactions? The houses don't have sensors on them. so you don't actually know what the actual air quality is for these houses. And so this is a classic prediction problem or spatial prediction problem, also called interpolation problem. So we come up with a surface of, for example, predicted uh, particles based on the measures at the sensor locations and a statistical model. In this case, it's called a Kriging interpolation. And that's a pretty standard operation, which actually is um, often relevant when you combine data from different worlds. So in a lot of health, public health applications, you have um, health information, say, at a census tract or some other aerial unit. But air quality is only for a few sensors, so you need to interpolate this. And that interpolated data then becomes an input into your analysis. Then the third set, which is really what I'm going to focus on in this particular course, is what we call lattice data. And lattice data are aerial units, uh, polygons in other words, census tracts, counties, countries even. And here the question is really about the combination of what I call locational similarity and attribute similarity. So locational similarity is our areas close to each other, attribute similarity is our, the values for a particular variable of interest are correlated in some way. So we are interested in finding hot spots, cold spots, associations, structural breaks, things of that nature. We'll go through that um, throughout the course. Uh, a big part of this is cluster detection. So to give you an example, this is a map of census tracts in Chicago that show a measure of income inequality by means of the Gini index. So this is this type of map is what I call a box map. We'll see it uh, later uh, in more detail. And so the darker red values have higher income inequality. The blue ones have lower income inequality. So 
how can we simplify this map? How can we focus in on the more interesting parts, so to speak? And that's where this clustering technique, which we already saw an example of, the local Moran, comes into play. And so basically we identify areas of clusters of high income inequality surrounded by other tracts with high income inequality as the reds and the dark blues are low income inequality con uh, surrounded by other low and, and so on. So we'll see a lot of these kinds of uh, techniques to identify what I call interesting locations. Um, so a couple of things to think about before you delve into analysis. And these are very specific to spatial analysis. First of all, are the data sampled or do you have everything? Do you have the population? So in the case of the sensor locations, we only have a few, in the case of LA, a 30-some sensors, and we're trying to use that information as a sample from the total surface. So we're trying to predict the total surface from a sample of locations. Whereas if we have all the census tracts in the city, there is no sampling. And then the way we deal with this statistically is we think of it as a spatial process, a spatial stochastic process. We won't get into that too much in this course, but that's basically how you get from something which is seemingly impossible dealing with the whole population to still using statistical inference. Another big distinction, and we saw this already, is are the spatial units discrete, aerial units like census tracts or counties, or are they continuous like the air quality surface we just saw? And then are the locations given, again our census tracts, we have them, or are they themselves random, for example the events, the burglaries, or the car thefts? So this is interesting if we want to look at not just the concentration of events, but also maybe say the severity of events. And let's say we're interested in finding out uh, where people live that have tested positive for COVID, but we also want to know uh, whether they're sick or not and how long they're sick. So then that's not the same as looking at census tracts with some rate of COVID positivity, but we have the individual locations and these individual locations are actually the outcome of some kind of statistical process which com complicates uh, the analysis somewhat. So these are all kinds of things we have to think about when delving into spatial analysis. And it's very important before you embark on your project that you step back a little bit and think about what these concepts actually mean for you and for your analysis. Then to close, a couple of downsides. These are traps, these are pitfalls. There's three classic pitfalls, problems in spatial analysis. One very well known ecological fallacy, that is where individual behavior is explained by means of aggregate data. And um, this is often cited as a main or even a fatal flaw of spatial analysis. And it all depends what the research question is. Is your research question is about um, police implementations at the county level, then having data at the county level is fine, but that doesn't explain individual criminal behavior. So that's very important to keep in mind that there has to be a match between the scale of the process that you're studying and the scale at which you get your measurement. And the key variable is, you know, if you're going to model aggregate phenomena, you have aggregate uh, explanatory variables. If you're going to model individual behavior, you can still have aggregate uh, explanatory variables, but more in a multi-level context, in a multi-level uh, form of behavior. So this is the classic one. Um, when you do aggregate analysis, you're, there's bound to be somebody in the audience who's going to raise the ecological fallacy problem. So the, the answer is to have a match between the scale of the process of interest and the scale of the data at which you do the analysis. So if you're 
process of interest is individual behavior, your data should be individual. If it's aggregate behavior, the data can be aggregate. So that's the first one. This is a classic one also in social science, much debated. Uh, the second one is a little bit uh, more particular to geography. It's called the modifiable aerial unit problem or MAUP. And it really has to do what is the, with the proper scale of analysis, proper spatial scale. And there's a classic paper by Stan Openshaw entitled A Million Spatial Autocorrelation Coefficients. And so uh, what Stan Openshaw did, he looked at the electoral results in, I believe it was Iowa, and looked at them starting at the ward level and then going up to higher and higher levels of spatial aggregation. And he showed that depending on the level at which you computed the autocorrelation coefficients, they went from positive to negative. So then the question is, which is it? And, and this, this is a, a big problem in spatial analysis because you really, again, have to think about the match between the process that you're thinking about and studying and the data that you collect. And my colleague, former colleague Waldo Tobler of Tobler's Law, which we'll talk about later, always said, well, you should know what the proper scale of analysis is. And he dismissed this MEUP as a real problem. But it, it is a problem because oftentimes we have data at multiple scales and it's not always clear what the proper scale of analysis is. In addition, there's this concept of spatial heterogeneity that we'll talk about a lot later, is that different processes or the process changes as you move between locations and scales. And the distinctive part about the MAUP or the modifiable aerial unit problem is that it's not just a scale issue, which is classic in all the social sciences, an aggregation, micro macro type of issue, but it's also spatial arrangement and the arrangement of the spatial units matters. And here's an illustration of this. So in figure A, we have five hypothetical regions with micro units in them. And then in B, we have the scaling issue. So we disaggregate the larger units into smaller units and then we have to figure out which is the proper scale of analysis. But in addition, we can also change the boundaries, and that's called the zoning problem. So MEUP is really a combination of scaling and zoning problem, which makes it a purely geographical problem. And then the solution, of course, is to do the analysis at the individual level, if you can, but that's not always possible. And then the last um, aspect is a more of a statistical issue, and it's it's called in the literature change of support problem or COSP. And so this is, and we already talked about this, this is when you have variables measured at different scales, different spatial scales. And there's basically two different cases. One is what I call a nested hierarchical case. So counties within states, states within countries, those kinds of things, you know, um, classic hierarchical structures that cleanly aggregate into each other. But then you also have situations where they are not nested, non, non, not overlapping. I mean, they are overlapping. They're not cleanly hierarchical. And an, a common example of this is uh, school districts, which are not always aligned properly with, say, census data. So then the question is, how do you create median income for a school district, and, and that's a change of support problem. So the solutions are, the easy one is aggregate up to a common scale and then work at that scale, but then you um, run the danger of the MEUP. Is that scale still appropriate for the kind of analysis you're trying to carry out? And then the more sophisticated solution is to interpolate or impute, and typically the solutions uh, to that are Bayesian and involve Bayesian statistics, which we won't get into in this class. So basically, this gives you uh, a kind of an initial sense, still continuing what is special about spatial, how do different um, geographical structures for the observations, points, lines, polygons, networks, translate into different kinds of statistical uh, 
operations, statistical hypotheses, and statistical tests, and what do we need to be careful for. So um, that's kind of the introduction for this first module. A big part of this module, and I don't have any narrated slides for this, is the actual uh, practice of data wrangling. And this is well documented in the notebooks, and I just encourage you to go there. And as always, if you have questions or issues to talk about, send me an email or set up a Zoom appointment.